Hello, this is Julia Whitup with Talk Story TV, and I have with me this morning Richard Barnes, who has written seven books, and he's written an article for us at tvbackstory.com about the writer's lifestyle. So uh, that's what I would like to talk to him about today. And um, tell us how you happened upon your perfect lifestyle there. Well, uh, my perfect lifestyle is writing. Uh, uh, I think I said in my blog to you that uh, I got started writing uh, through a writer's group. Actually, I took a, a course in short story writing and uh, found that uh, I like my short stories better than the instructors. <laughs> so so um, I thought, well, maybe I'll... I'll pursue this a little bit and then a friend of mine was in a writer's group and got me started with uh, writing more short stories and I had a, uh, an idea for a for one that uh, just was too big uh, for a short story so uh, he said you know you gotta put it in a book and I said I can't write a book <laughs> and it turned out a hundred thousand words later I wrote a, a historic novel about World War II about a um, liberty ship that traversed the Pacific and visited several islands, which was of always interest to me because uh, I grew up in an era uh, where I heard a lot about World War II but didn't know anything about those strange sounding islands. So that's what that first book was about. Is that Luzon? No, that's a book called The Cord in Snow, which is a, just a made-up name of a ship. Oh, okay. And, uh, yes. And Luzon was also about World War II. Yes, that's, that, I've written three historic novels. Uh, Luzon is about World War II. And it's about the Japanese attack on the Philippines a day after Pearl Harbor. Oh. And very few people really know that story. And it's also in the story I have, uh, I write about uh, the Nissan, which are the first generation Japanese Americans and how they were treated. And my hero in that story is a first generation Japanese boy that goes back to the Philippines under the guise of a Japanese officer. And, or an American officer or a Japanese? Yes, yes. American yes. officer. Well, a Japanese officer, and he goes back to try to help uh, escape uh, a captured American officer. Oh, okay. Wow. I get the feeling that doing the research is just as much fun as doing the writing. Absolutely, Julia. It's... Um, to me, that's half the fun. And that's why I've written three historic novels, because actually, too, writing a historic novel helps you with the plot line. With, uh, doing the research, you can put a, a story around, around your research quite well. I also write mysteries. My last one was a mystery that I just uh, completed and, and have uh, submitted to my publisher. And uh, mysteries are a little harder because you've got nothing to go on except your imagination. With an historic novel, you've got a storyline almost set for you in, uh, in stone that you can weave. work around. Yeah. Right. What about spy novels? You seem like you'd be perfect for spy novels. Yeah, I, I haven't done one of those, and uh, except. Luzon has a little bit of espionage in it, in that uh, a hero is recruited by the uh, precursor of the CIA, the OSS. Okay. And I love spy novels. That's what I mostly read. Well, you'll have to read that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I did. I think I've already read that one. I, the, my, my latest is a, is a story about... about um, well, let me explain that I'm talking to you right now from my 
summer cottage. I see that. Like we and, see your staircase in the background. <laughs> yeah. And uh, our summer cottage is located on an island in northern Ontario near Sault Ste. Marie. It's where the uh, Lake Superior flows into Lake Huron. And there's a lot of history here. Uh huh. This island. There was a fort, a British fort on this island uh, from whence uh, a contingent of British soldiers and uh, a great many more Indians left in 1812 to, to uh, recapture Fort Michelinackinac, which is on Mackinac Island. And uh, they were successful in that endeavor. And then they, they vacated this fort, which later the Americans came up and burned. But this is all these forts were here to protect the fur trade. And oh, okay. so uh, my story is about a young uh, Scottish girl that gets married and comes over with her new husband and uh, unfortunately uh, falls in love with a uh, voyageur. Those are the, the canoers that uh, took people from the east to the west up the down the rivers and through the lakes. And she falls in love with this French Canadian uh, canoeist, canoeer, a voyageur. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a love story combined with all the history that happened around the time of the War of 1812. Okay, fabulous. That sounds interesting too. <laughs> Maybe. But, uh, I, I think you wanted to talk a little bit about more about about uh, how my my writing the well I'm the, yeah, I know a lot of writers are interested in how to make it work. Oh boy! Well, you know we're all uh, unless you're really well known, we're all struggling writers. And I'll be very frank. I about break even with all the. Uh, all the uh, expenses of uh, traveling, uh, promoting, promoting your work is, is hard, hard work and can be expensive. So I am very happy that I'm basically, I, I break even. Uh, you, unless you're very well known on royalties, you're not, not going to make a lot of money. Uh, I do my best work by buying my own books and then reselling them at events. Particularly with a historic novel, it's a lot easier. To That's what tell. other writers have told me. Yeah. In fact, the best one is, is nonfiction. <laughs> but uh, selling fiction is tough. So I do it. I've been very successful this summer in uh, that my book is about this area. People are interested in this area. And uh, I have had two um, book signings. Uh -huh. and I'm going to be uh, featured at an event at this fort that we're talking about that is celebrating the 200th anniversary of the burning of that fort. And, uh, and will you be speaking or just? I, no, I will just be signing my book. Oh, okay. All right. So are you doing speaking too to promote your books? I I have not yet. I have, I have had uh, appearances at book clubs, uh -huh. okay. but I have not uh, done a speaking tour. What about placing your book with different oh shops and restaurants in the area? Is that does that work? It does indeed. I have my uh, my books at. Uh, a ice cream store that also sells novelties and uh, tourist material. This is a this is a summer cottage, uh -huh. uh, vacation area. So people come up here, and and they and from this ice cream store is right across from a, a very well traveled marina. So okay. the people come off the boats, want something to read, and I've done pretty well selling books there. And there's a little, small little market that sells uh, 
fresh vegetables. <laughs> this woman <laughs> selling a lot of my books. She's doing a great job. So that's well, that's good. the thing. And then, the, then the fort that I'm talking about, they feature my books too. Okay. I was thinking that'd be a good place because uh, we have a boat and that's what I do on the boat. Is read. Yeah, is read. Yes. Oh, I, that, I think that's true. People are just want something to do when they're on the, when they're not sailing, they right. come into the harbor and they want a book to read. So they, they come into this little shop and when they see my books that are there for sale, Oh, what's that? And, she, and my, uh, the lady that runs that shop is a, a very good sales lady. And oh, she okay. <laughs> yeah. When there's no wind, <laughs> you might as well read. <laughs> So, okay, so that's one of the things that works for you. But if you're retired, you can just kind of do it be as a way of life, right? Yeah, I, I uh, to me, writing is a, a good reason to get up in the morning. And uh, there's probably, um, I don't care who you are or what age you are, that's a wonderful thing to have. Yeah, and something to go to bed and, and say, oh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow, and I've got to do this. So I I really I really found my my niche. I read that Hemingway left. Uh, he would deliberately stop almost in the middle of a sentence, even so that he would he would already be jump started the next day. Oh, what a great idea! <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, oh, I didn't finish that paragraph or that sentence, and then there he'd go. That's true. That's a, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Well, uh, but but I don't necessarily do any more writing up here and, uh, than I do it uh, when I'm back at my, my home. I live in uh, near Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, I don't my, – my lifestyle is uh, – not significantly changed. Oh, so you don't just suddenly write a ton of stuff while you're up at the cabin? I, I probably write more at home than here, but uh, it, it turns out in the last few years that I finished a manuscript sometime in, in the spring and, or, and, uh, or early or late winter and uh, had the summer to do my marketing, which that just has worked out that way. I haven't planned. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that is the good way to do it because then it's a lot nicer to travel in the summer. I, uh, right. <laughs> uh, I, you might want to, uh, your listeners might be interested in, in how I write. Oh, okay. I, I love to write in cursive, and I, so I, I don't write for my, I started out just writing for my computer. When I was writing short stories, I grew up on my computer, and I thought, well, when, it, when your story gets more complex, you want, you're doing an awful lot of erasing, and, and I found that I really enjoy the repetitive mechanics of writing longhand. So I have spiral notebooks and I use pencil. I use a, a mechanical pencil and I write my first draft out in longhand. Then when I transfer that, I usually maybe 500 words to a thousand words mm -hmm. and I, I'll transfer that to the computer and when I do that, I make a lot of improvements and changes. And that's almost like writing a second draft. Oh, okay. And yes, and so I find that that is uh, very helpful in going back and, and, and taking out trite sentences and repetitive uh, uh, adjectives. Mm -hmm. Taking out adjectives, <laughs> taking out adverbs in my quotes, and things like that. So, I think well, maybe um, your unconscious mind has a little more input when you use uh, longhand too. 
it's coming out of your body. It, it's true, exactly. It just seems to flow when I write longhand. I just start now. I look, and I, my God, I've written two pages, and I can't even remember doing it. So that is a uh, that's a big plus for me. Uh, yeah, I, I'm thinking seriously. I'm going to try that for a while, and I'm going to try dictating R, because there's so many places where you can have it transcribed free or cheap now. <laughs> yeah, I tried to dictate, and you can probably tell by this interview, I my. Uh, Verbal skills aren't probably what they should be, and so I don't dictate as well as I. I think better when I have a pencil in my hand. I always do. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, that'll give some people some things to think about. This digital generation probably doesn't think about using longhand at all. Well, I don't think they don't even teach cursive in school anymore. I can't believe that either, because it really makes things flow. Oh, I can't imagine having to print what I do. It would really make your whole communication choppy. If I were a better typist, you know, and didn't have to, I kind of half, half peak when I type. I do too. <laughs> and so if I were a better typist, perhaps uh, it would be the same as writing, writing cursive. And people these days, kids are, they can, uh, type faster with their thumbs than I can think. They don't spell very well though. Have you seen how they how they write things on right. those text messages? <laughs> Although I've seen a whole novel written in Pigeon, which I thought would be very difficult, but after you get into it you start uh, following the flow. Right. You, you don't have to worry about grammar. Right. I guess you do because you probably have to stick to how they would say it in pigeon, and depending on which pigeon you're working with. Who's going to who's gonna argue? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Richard. And... Um, I'll send people to the article, and that will be a link to your book, I assume. Yes, I, I certainly would uh, love people to take a look at uh, my last novel, Forgotten Roots. Forgotten? Uh, roots. For Forgotten Roots. Okay, Forgotten because Roots. And if you would like to send me a copy, I do promotional contests where I give away books that people have sent me. Well, let me uh, wait. So I'm waiting on a, a reorder uh, from my publisher. And uh, yes, uh, we can do that. Can okay, so watch for that. Watch for that book as one of our giveaways at TalkStoryTV.com and read Richard's article at TVBackstory.com. And do you have a website, Richard? Yes. This uh, RichardWhittenBarnes.com. How do you spell Whitten? W-H-I-T-T-E-N. So Richard Whitten Barnes, B-A-R-N-E-S. Dot com. Dot com. Right, nothing in between, no dots or anything. Okay, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Julia.